Now, welcome along to the Huddle Breakdown, the podcast that looks at the stats, XG and performance of Celtic FC. We've got a lot to cover today, so I'm going to spare you the long-winded intro. Jico James and Alan Morrison, hello. Hello. Hey, guys. Right, so we've got two games to get into, so let's get straight into it. Alan, you're going to take the St. Mirren defeat. James, you're going to take the Kilmarnock win. Alan, did St. Mirren deserve to win at Parkhead for the first time in 34 years? Without a shadow of a doubt. And when, when I look at this game, there's a couple of couple of uh, things I want to really sort of focus on. Uh, uh, w- one is to sort of tr- actually use some very dull stats. What I mean by that is stats you may not think tell you a lot are actually quite instructive in this game, and I'll come to, to why that is. And the second thing is to really... Um, try and speak to the comments that McFadden made, I think, on in the Kilmarnock preamble, where he said that it looked like the Celtic team had lost interest and had effectively given up. So these are quite inflammatory, uh, you know, remarks about any professional team. And I, I, but 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 I can't actually disagree with them in terms of when I watched it and and my sort of emotional response to the game. Uh, but I wanted to see again what how would how would you from a data perspective give that sort of view any credence or does it have any credence? Is there any evidence for it? So I, want, I wanted to kind of hit on, the, on, those, on those two things really. But, but you have to as well, in terms of, you know, did St. Mirren deserve it? Put the game into context. It was literally their first win at Celtic Park since 1991, which is, you know, 30 years. And there's a reason for that, right? That's not, that's not an aberration of, 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 of bad luck. You know, there's a reason that Celtic nearly always beat a team like St Mirren at home uh, over a 30-year period, just because of clearly the disparity in resources. It does mean that St Mirren didn't even beat Celtic at home during the, during the mid-90s, which is actually quite quite uh, quite worrying. So, so it was a monumental um, result for them. And remember, that was on the back of them beating Dundee United uh, 5-1 away uh, in the midweek before the game. Now, I don't know the last time St Mirren ever won a top flight game 5-1 away from home. I suspect it was, I mean, you might have to go back further than the 1991 uh, season for the last Celtic win. So they've had, they had two absolutely monumental results in a week. But not only that, they actually made you know five uh, changes uh, between those two different teams. So I'll come on to that in a minute. The other reason, again, just to place the defeat into context, is Celtic's expected goals that's for, that, for the single game was less than one. I had it as 0.93. Uh, and you know, I know we talk. I know we expected goals in a single game is is some people kind of poo poo that. Certainly, I would agree with that in terms of if you were building any conclusions about future performance. But it is useful. It's a useful stat to look at in terms of the context of that particular game. Now, Celtic don't actually have an xG of less than one very often, and that's why again I'm, I'm calling that one out. It happened once in the 16-17 season, uh, where we beat Aberdeen one nil. It didn't happen at all in the 17-18 season. It happened once in the 18-19 season, and that was again against Aberdeen, and that was a nil-nil draw. It didn't happen at all last season. I'm talking about home games here. Uh, but it's happened four times. In, so four times uh, in home games uh, in, in the SPFL, Celtic have not managed to get at least one expected goal uh, this season. Now, in, in the previous uh, four seasons, the only time it happened was both times against Aberdeen, both, te- both times against a team that was really challenging Celtic at the top of the league. Never happened against, let's call it, a bottom six team. So, and, Ab- and, the, Aber- and the fact that it happened against Aberdeen is quite instructful because, uh, you know, they set up in both of those matches in a very similar way to St Mirren with a, with a, with a man-to-man orientated uh, uh, approach to marking the, the midfield. So, so again, to put this into context, this, these, these are awful times and these are awful performance uh, underlying data uh, that, that we're seeing here. Uh, and so, you know, coming back to McFadden's comments, you know, that all adds to, to that context. Mm-hmm. You, you yeah. know, sorry, go on. Yeah, I, w- I was just going to say that there's a huge Irish contingent at Simran and Jamie McGrath was actually the man of the match. So in terms of this game, one thing that I noticed was that St Mirren were very noticeably pushing Celtic inside and bunching that area outside their box and forcing Celtic to play out wide to the wide men that they knew could not threaten them because of their output into the box. Is that something that is reflected in the data of this game as well? No, absolutely, absolutely agree. I mean, they set out with a, a three-man defence and that three-man three, three defence never moved um, horizontally the whole game. 
they moved vertically, as in they went up and down the pitch occasionally, but horizontally they were never pulled out of position. And I'll tell, this is so when when I when I record these matches, when I capture the data, right? Um, within about fifteen minutes, I know all the names, obviously, of the opposition players. I know what position they're in. I know whether they're right-footed, left-footed. And I actually can tell when who gets the ball just by the way they run, uh, which player it is. Because you're, you're watching it, you're watching it in that level of detail. No, 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 no word of a lie. I did not know that St Mirren had a player called McCarthy that was sat in the middle of the back three until the 87th minute when he blocked a shot. I I I'd, I'd, I'd never even knew he was on the pitch. Honest to God, uh, because he just never was, was pulled out of position, and he never was was called into any sort of real kind of action. And then what they had in front of that was effectively had a midfield six. And that was really to counteract the um, the diamond. So as, as you say, rightly, they, they pushed they pushed the, the game in. But that wasn't hard against, on the one side, Ayer, who, you know, really was quite peripheral because he's a, he's a centre-back. And on the, le- on the left, Taylor, who, who does lack pace to, to unpick um, those sort of defences. And that's how they were set up. But, you know, Celtic have faced these problems before, right? And a Celtic team in full flow will usually find a way. Those Aberdeen games that I mentioned, you know, one of them they won 1 0, the other was a draw, but it was towards the end of the season. And, and, and I think actually the league might already have been virtually over at that point. If you look at this game, there's actually some quite in, insightful stats that show, you know, actually not, so, not even so much how well did St. Mirren play. And I think we have to give them huge credit because. You know they kept up the intensity of their press and they kept up their work rate in terms of closing Celtic players down, uh, as well as Livingston had done when they'd drawn nil nil a few weeks ago. Very similar performance in that sense because Livingston, if you recall, had three forwards or three players, two wide, one central, who were all around five foot six and just ran ran their socks off. And St. Mirren had exactly the same. You know the Dennis, Dermis, and McAllister, all tiny guys. I think Dennis is maybe five ten. Uh, who just just ran and ran and pressed and pressed, mm-hmm. and 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 um, you know, Goodwin took them took two of them off after sixty minutes. Um, you know, no sentiment, no no. He was pretty ruthless and said, right, you run yourself into the ground. I'm going to put on another two players to do exactly the same thing for the rest of the thirty minutes. So, but if you look at it, did Celtic actually put them under under any? You know, what the, what 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 are the stats that show that Celtic they might support McFadden's assertion that Celtic really weren't putting in the physical effort. Well, St Mirren committed five fouls. I mean, they weren't exactly having to fly into tackles, making last-ditch clearances. They only had 14 clearances. So there, were, there, were hard, there was no sign that St Mirren were under any concerted effort. Clearances, as I mentioned last week, pretty boring stat, but it can be interesting. You'd expect a team who's under pressure, on the back foot, to be hoofing the ball here, like right, left and centre, to relieve pressure. 14 clearances St Mirren had to, had to effect over the 90 minutes. Another dull stat that's quite in, that quite insightful in this game: recoveries. So recoveries is where you know the team effect. It's something actually effectively. There's been a challenge in midfield, let's say, and the ball goes to your player. That you count that as a recovery. You've effectively recovered a loose ball, taking possession of the ball after a, a challenge or a or a piece of or a loose pass or something like that. Now, generally and remarkably, recoveries are fifty fifty. In Celtic matches, which, which is quite—I've been thinking about that. It's quite strange because Celtic have to have about sixty-three percent possession in 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 most games, and that's a pretty constant thing over last season and this. And yet recoveries are fifty-fifty. And I think the reason for that is um, obviously Celtic have a lot of possession, so the other team recover the ball uh, on the back of that when Celtic don't you know don't don't, don't get a shot off or anything. Um, and, and similarly, when when Celtic, when when the other opposition get the ball, they generally are under a lot of pressure. And therefore, although they have low possession, they tend to have possession for a very short period of time. And therefore, it kind of end up, you end up with a situation where both sides have the same number of recoveries. Now, in this game, Celtic had 130 recoveries and St Mirren had 142. That's a, that's a, statistically, that's quite a big disparity from the norm. That suggests to me, and this, 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 this is echoed in the Cluj games, is the closest I can see, where a team is, is set up to win that second ball. They know that Dennis isn't going to win a header against Duffy, but they're primed to win the second ball and, they, and, then, and then transition from there. And they did that very well. Celtic lost the ball 48 times in the final third. That's the highest, um, the only highest game was against Ross County. And I think we can probably all agree that the Ross County performance was perhaps the most abject any of us have seen in our, in our lives because 
we know how poor Ross County are. Um, the other times where we lost the ball 48 times, of around that number of times in the final third, we're drawing 1-1 at Kilmarnock against Ferenc Varos and against an away in the away European games against Riga and Sarajevo, both of which, although Celtic won, were, 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 were dire, dire games against really poor opponents. I, I capture something, something that I'll introduce a new one for you. I, I calculate something called final third effectiveness, which is a percentage. And essentially, it's the number of times you lose the ball in the final third without producing anything versus did you get a shot or did you win a corner? At least produce something and mm -hmm. kept possession or kept pressure on. Normally, that's around 30 to 35%. This time, it was 28. Generally, if Celtic hit under 30 in their final third effectiveness, they ain't winning the game. Um, whereas St Mirren were up at 40%. They, they made the most of every right. every opportunity that they got in the final third. So so all of those all of those pieces of data that which which are not expected goals, they're not um you know some of the more kind of um eye-catching stats that I capture, but they all do support McFadden's assertion that we were outworked, we we were making poor decisions, the concentration, the work rate, confidence, give it a label. But all of those things look to contribute to what was ultimately um, a really poor performance. Yeah, and it's not for the first time that Neil Lennon called out his players after the game. And boy, did he call out the players after the end of the St. Mirren game. Obviously, that's a, a disappointing performance, disappointing result. I, I might come back to Shane Duffy and his mistake a little oh, bit later on when we yep. address the, the comments, because yeah, a lot of okay. people have been in touch with us to, to talk about um, the difference between Welsh and, and Duffy at the minute. So we might come back to that. If you want to end. come back to that, that's fine. I did a piece yeah. on the goals that we conceded and Duffy's role in those. So we can come back to that by all means. But yeah, that's a, just another, another. Alan, Alan's story the assassin that. today. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we, <laughs> I, yeah just, I just, I just call it as a it's usually listen, my role. <laughs> listen, listen, credit, credit, credit to Goodwin, right? And to St. Mary and those players like Livingston, you know, and again, Livingston play, put out virtually their B team and drawing nil nil. They mm -hmm. absolutely work their socks off. And you sort of think, why, why do Celtic players look under pressure? And the stats back this up, as I've just explained, and St. Mirren players don't. <laughs> because, and that's, that comes down, to, it comes down to work rate. Now, I can't measure work rate as a, as a definitive, this number equals work rate, but, but you can infer it from these pieces of data that the work rate simply wasn't there. They were simply putting more into the game than Celtic were, physically. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I, I think it's very telling that sides like St. Mirren and Livingston aren't afraid to co come to Celtic Park now and make changes before the game. And I think Livingston made more than five changes before that, that draw changed. as well. And then St. Mirren make four coming into this game. So it, it, that's telling for me that sides are no longer fearing coming to Celtic. And that's one of the intangible things that you can't actually measure in terms of the, the fear factor of coming to Celtic Park and almost being defeated in your own head before you actually you get there in the first place. Moving on then, to the Kilmarnock win on Tuesday night, a rare Tuesday night game. Scott Brown with a goal, Odson Edward with two, and Albion Ajeti as well getting a goal. As well. Um, Lennon made a couple of changes for this game as well. Stephen Wells came in, John Joe Kenny came in at right back. He obviously went with the two up front with Albion Ajeti and Edward, and Scott Brown played deep in the, uh, in the deep line midfield role. James, you're going to take this one. I saw your good, bad, and ugly. I was watching this game and I thought, are Celtic actually playing well here? And now I'm now I'm questioning whether they actually did play well at all. Yeah, not not so much. Um, before I get into that, I just wanted to touch on something relative to uh, uh, Alan's excellent summary of of the Saint Mirren game. I think that something to draw from the Saint Mirren game is. You know, there's been this narrative starting to develop as an excuse, I think, out of some quarters, particularly people surrounding the club, let's say, whether at the executive level, the board level, um, even the manager, uh, pe people that are kind of uh, related to these, those people and defending them publicly, is that, the, that a big part of Celtics' problems this year have been because of players wanting to be away, uh, not putting forth effort. And, uh, you know, downing tools in a, some sense. And the way I think about Allen's uh, characterization of that game is you, you can infer that to a degree. And on mass and mass for the rest of the season, 
for the most part, that has not been the problem. Work rate has been, uh, you know, has it been optimized to 100 percent? You know, maybe it's 98 percent, maybe it's 99 percent. So uh, there's many other analytically viable ex explanations. You know, if you talked about a, a statistical factor model, the, 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 the reasons why Celtic have had problems this year, and we'll get, I'll get into that. The reason why this is a good transition into the conversation about the Kilmarnock game. It, it's not because players have not been trying. Um, th there's that again, that would be clear in, in a lot of the things like Alan suggested relative to the St. Marin game. So they should be slaughtered for that performance. Right. They, they absolutely look like a team that weren't all that interested. Um, but that was not the case for, for most of the rest of the season when the results actually mattered. Right. So, uh, as, as the epitaph of this season is written, uh, you know, one of the things I'm going to try and do publicly is, is not allow that to become the narrative. Do yeah. what I can, because it's inexcusable. That, that has not been the reason. And, and it's also, sorry, James, and it's also, it's, it's such a lazy and easy thing to throw at a team. Um, and also, like you say, you can use it almost as an excuse to cover other tactical and decision-making, um, you know, limitations. But, but which is why I, I only call it out when I, when I can evidence it. And Livingston, exactly. Ross County... And, and Hamilton, absolutely, I can back that up. Yeah, and I, I don't know whether or not, um, you know, again, I, I've said this over and over again this season, which is in isolation, a lot of things haven't been big problems or big issues. It's when you stack them up that they start to, you know, create a, 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 a train wreck context. So I don't know, Alan, or if you know this off the top of your mind, my guess is at least one or two of those Aberdeen uh, performances were in the holiday period, you know, kind of a December fixture pile up where we, you know, where we had less than one XG mm, at the home. One, one was actually to the, uh, to the day, the same date as the same okay. game. And one was in March. Towards in March. Season. Okay. Well then Easter sort of yeah. characterize me as wrong. Um, <laughs> but you know, w w when, when you start thinking about, you know, when do teams kind of, you know, take a game off, you know, that does happen. Right. So there are games when, you know, collectively the players, for whatever reason, just don't, you know, as the, the, the phrase uh, goes, you know, they don't turn up, so to speak. Um, I think that phrase is horribly overused, but it does happen on occasion. Yeah. Um, so I mean, Celtics, sorry, Celtics, December, we, we habitually, when the season's normal, Celtic normally have like nine games in December. Right. And, 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 and you see that if you look at the results, you'll see home to Partick Thistle 1 0, home to St. Mirren 2 0. Right. You'll, you'll see these just do enough to win the game type of promises. And actually, we're, I'm pining for one of those. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny you say Partick Thistle there, Al, because one of the things that stuck in my mind is, you know, the, the invincible season, Celtic were so dominant relative to opposition, even on an XG basis. But Partick Thistle was one of the teams. I think they actually outperformed on an XG basis in December against, you know, the Rodgers managed team. Um, so, again, that does happen on a, as a one off. So let's mm -hmm. transition to Komarnik. Um, so when, when you look at things through an XG lens, it was close enough, you know, again, irrelevant of the XG model. Right. So, you know, Y Scout has their model. Instat has theirs. Allen has his. You know, Ortec has theirs. The modern football guys have theirs. You know, there's there's different ways to construct an XG model. Um, whether or not it was 1.4 to 1.3 or 1.6 to 1.2, in my mind, I don't really care in a one-off game about the specifics. But the the reality is that you know the general conclusion you can draw is it was relatively close. Uh, now there's game state issues there, meaning that you know teams score and get a couple of goals early. Uh, you know, like Brown's header isn't something that you would normally count on, so to speak, in a, in a Celtic performance to score a goal. And it wasn't a high XG opportunity. So, you know, there's some game state variance there as well. James, but generally sorry, speaking. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt. Can I yeah. just ask you, sure. um, was, was, was the cross in 10 minutes when, when Burke, knew, Taylor just stopped, you put enough physical pressure on Burke to stop him scoring because he got the ball. Was that counted as a shot? Because I counted yeah, so, it as a shot. Yeah. Because that's a high, that was quite high XD chance, right? Yeah, the, the one, the one that was saved by uh, a no, Bain so or a different in, one? In, the, in the tenth minute, when oh, tenth um, minute. when the cross came in from the the left, and, yeah. it, and Bain, Bain let it drop two yards from goal, and Taylor just put enough pressure on Taylor yeah, was, I, was the wrong actually, Alan, Taylor I don't was think... the wrong side of Burke, and Burke yeah. got a foot on it, but he couldn't get any any leverage on it, 
and I'll Bane just check. picked it up. That could have been a penalty, I, 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 by the that way. That's a great chance. That yeah, could have been a penalty. Yeah, actually, that's a good question, Alan, because um, I think why I don't think Y Scout did because they um, I think they had the game at eleven shots, and I so, saw so, other. So Burke, Burke touched the ball, so to me, that's a chance, yeah. right? Because he yeah. got there first, right? And and that's you know th this this so if you go back to uh, a, a model like something what they call expected threat, so Celtic dominated the game. I mean, they had possession around Kilmarnock's box relentlessly, um, so. You know, again, part of what we do here is try to look at a mosaic of of uh, of the game. So Celtic dominated the game, um, but it, did it really turn into anything? And from a from a chance creation perspective, I, my favorite stat of the game is, and I think it encapsulates the game, is uh, Edward had 16 dribble attempts and was only successful on two of them. So in him collecting the ball, turning and trying to take on players, I mean, it it was. Yeah, excuse my French, a shit show. Um, so, you know, that was the kind of game it was. It was kind of a coin toss. I, I in my good, bad, the ugly, I, I kind of referenced it uh, back to the uh, the uh, Hibs game in September where we won 3-0. And at the time, it was like this collective relief, you know, because we'd been playing so poorly over the the preceding three or four weeks. It was kind of still the post ferenc Faros hangover. So we were grinding out results, but we weren't really playing that well. And then there was this collective just, you know, euphoria about this game and, and a common narrative that it was this, uh, you know, excellent performance. And then I got absolutely slaughtered on Twitter when I put out my thread, basically sharing the stats, which said, yeah, maybe not so much. <laughs> and this game reminded me of that because we're all so desperate for, you know, entertainment for the first part. I mean, there was at least some entertaining goals in this game. Mm -hmm. So from an entertainment value, I get, you know, again, cognitively why people are, are uh, responding to the game the, the way they have. But I, when I get concerned is more so people that shouldn't be responding that way, i.e. the manager of the team who might in theory should have a better sense of performance levels relative to results. Um, yeah, it was not a good performance. It just wasn't. And we've, we've had difficulty on plastic pitches like most teams do. I mean, it's just a difficult environment to go into. The weather was horrific. You know, I, I joked before the game, you know, I felt bad for Kenny that that was his introduction was on a on a nice, bright February night going into Kilmarnock, your, your first uh, Celtic appearance. Um, now, I, what I will say is and I did a thread on this yesterday. Um, the 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 main structural problems that we've had really for two seasons uh, relative to uh, defending um really are exasperated this season. And, and you know, again, I, I, I point this out um, because I think it really has been structural and that's relative to Brown playing. And uh, one of the stats, and I don't think, Alan, you collect this specific one, but why Scout characterizes it, something called deep completion. Um, and basically I think of it as a proxy for a defensive midfielder or a deep line playmaker. And really what it is, is, you know, you're kind of outside of the, the 18, uh, somewhere maybe, you know, 20 to, to 35 yards out and then making some kind of pass forward uh, into a dangerous area. And they have a halo that they characterize that I with. Could, I, could, I could infer that from pack passes to either fullbacks or the, 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 the next midfielder, if you like. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So, so if you look at that stat, um, Kilmarnock had more of those kind of passes than Lil did in our three, two win. Um, so, and that we've in this season alone, if you just break down the, um, the games in which Brown has played versus those, which he hasn't. And I've excluded the two, you know, post Dubai debacle games, which, you know, I, I don't, I think they should be excluded from a sample because those two games were for obvious reasons, outliers. Uh, so it's basically, I believe 14 and nine. So 14 with Brown, these are league games, nine without Brown. Uh, we've surrendered four times the level of those deep completions when Brown has played, uh, four times. And we have produced about 20% less. So this has been my argument for a year and a half now 
which is the, the problem with Brown's decline. I've, I've talked about how he's, his lack of creativity is a major problem and how he kind of drags down uh, McGregor in, in that regard. And, and Alan and I have talked about that a lot. But by far, I think the biggest problem has been defensively, which is the exact opposite of what the narrative is as to Brown playing. Right. So <laughs> our defensive performances, our, our, our XG conceded with him this season is a, about one, a little over one. Uh, and when he hasn't played in those nine games, it's better than Rangers have done this season. So it's, it's sub 0.5 uh, in, in chance suppression. And in those nine games, we surrendered three goals. One was the own goal against Rangers, which, again, h- however you want to characterize that. Uh, and the other two were in the Livingston game, which, again, I would argue is, you know, to some degree after the players have mentally checked out. Right. I, I think there's some evidence to that, as Alan said about St. Marin, that, yeah. that the level of uh, application that has been coming out of the team that, post that game, July. That game's an outlier, could be conceived an outlier, but also because it's a combination of snow <laughs> and weather conditions and plastic, right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. Celtic, 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 Celtic had, that was the other game where Celtic, you know, had 108 misplaced passes because you're trying to pass the ball on an artificial surface where there's surface snow like, it, on an ice rink where one team is playing in the air all the time and the team's going to play on the ground so that's 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 not not the best sort of benchmark i would say yeah so the the reason why i went into this not only to kind of hopefully accurately characterize the Kilmarnock performance but uh it's more evidence that this narrative that um this season has been lost because of covid or players downing tools, or any of these things. We have tangible uh, uh, analytics-based evidence that that is absolute, absolute, excuse my French, bullshit, right? We had uh, a nine-game sample, which is not huge, but it, you know the nature of the sample. If you look at the XG differential, differential in those nine games, it's a little bit better than last season's average. Right. Chance creations down a little bit, but the actually chance suppression was better. So we were better defensively. Well, what's been the problem? The problem has been Brown's, you know, issues positionally and and what that's done to the midfield, the midfield and in defensive transition. Again, hasn't mattered less last year because he was in less decline last year. Um, but when we played decent teams last season, whether it's in Europe or the better teams in the league, again, that's where, you know, whether it was Cluj, whether it was Copenhagen, um, those defensive transitions. And when you get into games like uh, Kilmarnock, you didn't have, uh, you know, a, a, an, an inform Iyer and Julian, per, you know, bailing that out. Mm-hmm. So, again, this goes back to poor Post. Duffy. <laughs> poor Duffy this season, you know, for a large part of his sample – was playing behind a train wreck in midfield. And again, that's not all. I mean, Duffy's made a ton of his own mistakes, but that comes back to this, you know, spiral is confidence. The same with Barcast, right? So we've had all these issues that really started in midfield and how just disastrous our midfield was for the first three plus months of this season. So that, that's what I want people to come away with. And, I'm, and it's not 100% one person's issue in their inclusion. But th- this comes back to analyzing system dynamics is that when you have one cog in a machine that's not functioning properly, uh, you know, for, for not of any reason of their own, you know, it's not anyone's specific fault. You know, it's not because someone's not putting forth effort. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I said to Alan before, and I'm going to put this out on Twitter later today, so I'll probably get mobbed by uh, our 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 uh, our friends, some of our friends from uh, <laughs> our greatest rival, um, is I I started digging into Davis a little bit this morning, uh, because you know after last night's game with Rangers versus uh, St. Johnson, their chance creation has fallen off a cliff here, like well below last season's level. Um, Rangers, I'm talking about, and one of the theses I've had is because you know again I test I've I've watched a good number of their games. And um, one of my thesis has been, well, you know, Davis is 36 now. He's been in decline. Doesn't look like he's doing a lot to me creatively. Let me, I finally looked at the numbers this morning. I mean, it, it's, 
you know, he's in an age-based decline. So, uh, you know, you know, I, I've argued since the summer that Rangers are probably doing this stuff better than Celtic. I didn't say that, ever say that they were doing it well or great, <laughs> you know, so yeah, um, just better. Yeah, just better. You know, they're they're, they're taller than than, uh, you know, the other fifth grader. <laughs> um, it, it, so, you know, it, it, it's these things matter analytically because father time spares no one. And uh, the, the impact of this, I mean, you don't have uh, small declines, this, these network effects that take place when, when somebody, you know, hits the wall, so to speak, athletically and in their output. And, and the signs had started to emerge a couple of see, and Alan pointed this out, you know, he's been tracking this and other people have talked about it, but, you know, the, these declines really start around 33, 34. And then, you know, nor, it's normal for people to hit a cliff. They just literally fall off, you know, a cliff. So James, and, yeah. can I, sorry, can I just ask you on uh, McGregor last uh, of the Kilmarnock game? So I've not put this out yet, but I can I can assure everybody that McGregor's creativity stats uh, across the board have just gone up massively since he's moved to more of a left side of the diamond rather than having to cover as a, as a pseudo six for Brown. How did his numbers look from the Kilmarnock game? Did we see that regression? Yeah, I don't know. I, okay. I'll... I, I'll send you that one on on a message. Okay. I, no I did not note that one mentally. Okay. Um, so I, I looked at I didn't look at him closely. I just kind of look at generally. And he, you know, again, if if you if I look generally at most of the performances from most almost all of the players, it was just kind of a blah game. Uh, ironically, Brown was the one that stood out. Well, he played well. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he had you know, a terrific game. Give I mean, give him nine weeks rest. He comes back raring to go. <laughs> well, right, and and again, that that to me speaks to. The, this this the importance of having nuance right and part of part of the reasons that i that i took a lot of uh heat earlier in the season is because i i mean i understood it that people think that i'm you know doing something personal against certain people uh because i keep pointing out some of these issues um but you know he put forth a good effort he had a lot of output i i argued in my 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 uh, good bad the ugly thread i mean it was probably his best performance of the season when you look at the totality of his output so but that's that's not good enough. Meaning that we, you know, against Komarnik, who, you know, I think Alan, you'd said it reminds you of the Motherwell game, the four-one, where you know they were a bit of a mess. I mean, they they they, they weren't really. The reason Edouard had sixteen attempted dribbles was because he could get the ball, control it, turn, <laughs> mm-hmm. and run. Yeah, yeah. Any forever. any fit, any pressure on him at all? <laughs> well, right, and well, and if you look at their two central midfielders, it's Dicker and Power. Yeah, they're and, not gonna. They're not gonna go box to box. No, and uh, <laughs> but they know. are good at deep progression. Well, Dicker is anyway. Well, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so again, that 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 was a game where, you know, Brown isn't going to be pressured to the point where some of these other issues are are gonna, you know, and, and Kamarnik's not an explosive counterattacking team. I mean, Chris you know, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, they're they're just not very good. I mean, I as as an eyesore test, I mean, I find Kilmarnock probably the least uh, entertaining team to watch in the in the in the league. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, that's why I go into all of this is because I, I want the narrative to be an accurate one as we kind of diagnose and go through the autopsy of the season because I think it's important that um, that is understood so that we draw the right conclusions as we look forward, and yeah. and that's my biggest fear is that the diagnosis because of pride and egos and, you know, I don't know, analytical ignorance to a degree from leadership from the club, that they're going to they're gonna buy into these excuses and not address the fundamental problems uh, that were there, that were predictable, and that unfolded, and that were the reason. I'm not saying that that cost us the league. We may still have lost the league, but we sure mm-hmm. as hell wouldn't have lost it by what looks like it might be 20 you know, 20 plus points. Yeah. Uh, that's why it's, this has been a calamity uh, mm-hmm. is because of the incompetence, not because of all these other issues, which were externalities, which were bad luck in some circumstances, the, you know, the players getting COVID on international duty. I mean, of course, all of these things have, have been issues, but the vast majority of this, let's call it 90% has been self-inflicted due to incompetence. Yeah. And, and I think you hit on a key point there because this isn't a vendetta against Scott Brown because Scott Brown hasn't 
lost single-handedly lost Celtic the lead here no. this year. But if, if you take, say, Liverpool as a, a good example of how to sort of look at it on, on, a, on the pitch basis, Virgil van Dijk. Losing, losing a player like Virgil van Dijk is clearly going to affect the team. But what you don't hear or what you're what you're only starting to hear now is the effect that Virgil van Dijk has on the starting eleven. So you have to move Henderson back, you have to move Fabinho back. So that has a an effect on the midfield. And then that mid- effect on the midfield has an effect on the forward line and their creation. So you're on, you're looking at this with Scott Brown. Is he single handedly at fault for Celtic's bad performances? No. But having him in the side has such an effect on other players like McGregor and like the defense and like the fullbacks that it has a massive effect overall on the team's performance. And that's sort of where we're looking at here. That's that's where I see the issues coming from. Let's finish off with a few questions then, because I, I think there is a couple of key points that we didn't touch on in terms of both games. So let's start with one on the Kilmarnock game because it was the 34th starting line starting lineup that uh, Celtic have had this year and thanks to Tony McLaughlin who sent that into us so Craigie asks and this is one that I have as well what's the best way to get the best out of Edward sole striker behind the striker a striking partnership I I'm going to change that to fit my own narrative and my own question Albion Ajeti six goals seven starts why isn't he starting well, according to the manager, it's because he hasn't been uh, trying hard enough and wasn't fit enough. Um, you know, I, I, I have a hard time. Uh, if if Klamala were playing ahead of him, then I could buy that argument. Uh, but the fact that it was Lee Griffiths that was being selected ahead of him, I have a hard time uh, swallowing that one. Um, you know, I was excited when Ajeti was, was signed. Um, his profile to me... Uh, relative to a, a, an all-firing Edward, and, I, and again, I think Edward does deserve some criticism this season because he has played, I would argue, more selfishly. Meaning that he, he you know, that creative element that exploded post winter break last season with Griffiths has disappeared. I mean, his his output of uh, you know shot assists or key passes and XA. I mean, it's just what went from a tremendous level to almost non-existent now. So he's, he's still generating an acceptable level of uh, XG for as a striker. Um, but one of the things I thought he was ideal for was, you know, kind of the, the striker that drops deep. And, and that's what, if you look at heat maps, the weird thing is that he hasn't been the one dropping deep as much. Even when he was playing, if you look at the Comarnic game, it was a jetty that was dropping deep. Um, so I, I don't, you know, again, I don't know what's being coached. I don't know what the game plan is or the strategy. To me, Edward's ideal situation is having someone advanced beyond him, putting pressure on center backs, uh, and you know, using his dribbling, his face-to-face, you know, dominance of, of of attacking defenders when he's thinking creatively as well. Which mm-hmm. again, we haven't seen. And, and I think pr- pr- probably the the biggest. Uh, you know, uh, the worst thing that happened in the last uh, three plus seasons is that we were deprived of the opportunity of watching Edward play with Dembele. <laughs> um, <laughs> because I just, I mean, that would have been, uh, been great. Would have, you know, it would have been orgasmic. So the evidence for me is since we moved back to a diamond and, and a front two uh, behind, in front of that, uh, Edward's expected scoring contribution which is you know expected goals plus expected assists has gone way back to well well over one per game uh, and before it was hovering below and his expected assists had dropped down a lot i think some of that as james says i agree was down to selfishness and you can see that by number of dribbles attempted number of tackles lost in the final third because he's just lost the ball that was really prevalent early in the season poor i think lazy uh, selfish de- decision making um now the question then becomes well, who does he play with now we've not seen a lot of a jetty but what i have seen um asking him to play that role where he has to drop deep pull out wide is wasting what i think is, looks to me like a very talented penalty box striker yeah. if i was uh, coaching a jetty i would be saying to him i don't expect to see you out outside the width of the 18 yard box at any time during the game your job is to stay forward, to be on the last man, 
to hold the ball up if need be, but to always be operating within the con within the realms of that central position and goal. Because if you get the ball to him anywhere central uh, with the goal in his sights, what a finisher! Seriously, well, I, I think it was the St. Marin game. I commented on Twitter. I mean, he again. I always like my cross sport analogies. I mean, in in some sense, he's like an a throwback. Uh, basketball player that likes to get in the low post with a defender on his back and post up because, and, and, you know, uh, he's like a Zapata at, at Atalanta. You know, he, I love watching him do that. You know, he gets a center back on his back and then the ball gets played to his feet. And then what Atalanta does, it has all these guys running off him in this like great triangle, uh, you know, and then he pings it around. I mean, it's just fun to watch them. Mm -hmm. And, he got the ball played to his feet on a couple of occasions in the box. I think it was when he came on as a sub against St. Marin. And I watched this, I don't know, probably half a dozen times because I just couldn't believe it. You could just watch Tom Rogic and uh, I think Christie. I mean, no one made any runs. Rogic literally just stood there and watched them. Uh, and, and I mean, it was like uh, he stood there with the ball in a dangerous area where if anyone made some runs, you know, and he had his head up too. It's not like he had his head down and wasn't looking for options. So I, I agree with you, Alan. I, I think he has uh, tremendous potential if utilized properly yeah. uh, inside that area because he seems to be good on the ball too. And I think he's skilled in this area of hold-up play and being able to play teammates in. It's just, again, I have no idea why, but we don't seem to have – I mean, we haven't had a striker like that since Dembele. <laughs> Yeah, Belly was pretty adept at doing that. Um, so, you know, maybe it's because the players just aren't used to it or, you know, there was the work rate issue against St. Marin. But, you know, to Alan's point, I think he it's exactly, like he's, it's exactly it, what we need. Exactly what we need. Well, exactly. And, and you know, <laughs> even even that that cross that Klamala put in, um, I think it was in the, the Kilmarnock game, Ajeti was just off of it. You know, again, mm -hmm. the kind of finish that, you know, Gary Hooper finish, that we haven't had in a while where you have, you know, a box striker that's in central uh, getting on the end of crosses. And, and and I think that's been an issue relative to, you know, our our, uh, our our crossing effectiveness generally is because we just don't have that many people in the box that can finish other than maybe El Yunusi. He's, you know, pretty decent, it seems, aerially in that regard. Um, he's, a, he's, so, a, yeah, he's, he's also a young player, actually. And, he, and he's, he's 23. Already, He's, he's had three. He's had three. Three. He's, even though he's only twenty-three, he's had three good productive seasons in the Swiss league, which I would argue is stronger than the Scottish league. So, yeah. so get, get him in. Get him play. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like Barkas. Give the guy a chance. Give him the confidence. Let him play. Yeah, yeah he's, have have Edward fulfill the role of dropping deep. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> well, which is good. Again, I, I, I'll I'll share the heat map. I mean, on Twitter, it's crazy. Uh, the, the the bizarro world game where. Edward was advanced and Jetty was dropping. I, I, I don't know if that was organic or if that was the game plan, but if it was the game plan, what the hell are they doing? I don't understand that. Yeah, Jetty is, as I would describe him, sort of like Robbie Keane, like incredibly effective in the, the box. Pace, but yeah, why, yeah. why would you, why would you expect him to do the dirty work? That's not what the the type of player that he is from from first glance. Anyway, just to finish off, then I know there's limited data on this, Alan, but. Stephen Welsh versus uh, uh, Shane Duffy is something that <clears throat> someone, loads of people actually, about five or six yeah. people have gotten contact about. Yeah. Where where are we looking for this? Yeah, so I, I can, I, you're right, I don't have a lot of data on, on Welsh. Um, and so I'm going to give you a, a slightly non-statistical, but more of a sort of coaching perspective on that one, which is what I like about him is, and I'm not, listen, I'm, I, I'm, don't take away from this that I think Welsh is some kind of next Van Dyke, right? I think he's a pretty solid, competent defender. And at the moment, a solid, competent defender uh, is a massive upgrade on where where we've been. That, and that, and that, I'm sorry, but that that is just the way the where we are today, right? And, and Welsh looks like a player who um, he doesn't complicate his game. He doesn't complicate his defending. He he's positionally solid. Physically, he's not the biggest, so he does occasionally lose out on on high balls. Um, but his recovery pace is actually quite decent. I mean. I don't think Brof Brophy's quite quite nippy over ten yards, and he did outpace Brophy at one point in the Kilmarnock game. Um, he's just uncomplicated, and actually, what he added to his game against Kilmarnock, and again, 
context. Kilmarnocker, the most passive team Celtic had played all season by miles. There was very little pressure on the ball, but he started to see a few more packed passes, a few most progressive deep passes, as James called them, and that's probably the more the more analytical term uh, out from the back from him. So um, just just a very solid defender in compared to, to to Duffy, who I think just I would say overcomplicates the game. He makes decisions he doesn't need to make. I think he. I think with the best world in the world, he's trying to do his best. He's trying. He's genuinely trying to 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 have a, make a positive impact on the team, but he just causes chaos and confusion uh, all around him. The goal against St Mirren, the first goal, was actually a fantastic goal by St Mirren. I think you've got to give them a lot of credit because it came from the goalkeeper actually all the way through. Um, four, five passes, three of them were packed passes, a touch and a finish. It was a great goal by St Mirren. But the, if you wanted to look, and, and there were certainly issues you can you can um, take out of Celtic's uh, play there, as there always is. But the, I suppose if you had to put it down to one defensive error that, that was the most material would be because Sorrow was packed near halfway, which meant he was out of the game. Rather than Duffy saying, OK, you've breached that line, you're not going to breach this line, Duffy went to try and compensate for that. The fact that, that Sorrow wasn't there left a massive gap in. They were able to play two passes into Dennis and, and the goal. And this is what Duffy does. He chases problems rather than be, what, what, what somebody like Welsh who goes, OK, you're through. I'm, I'm going to hold my ground and you've got to get past me. You know, you, you can beat me and, and you might well beat me. Right. But, you, you know, I'm going to hold my position and do my job. And that's the that's the biggest difference between the two players. I, I will I will provide more of a statistical um, analysis on that. But if you look at Duffy against St Mirren, he won he won fourteen aerial duels, and you must think, wow, isn't that amazing? We just love that, right? Because St Mirren again, they were kicking the ball long to three five foot six guys. They weren't expecting to win the aerial duels, but they sure as hell were going to pile people in to win that second ball. Six mm-hmm. people in midfield. We win the second ball and we build from there. Um, but but people will go, oh yeah, but look at all the headers he won. Yeah, of course he did. He was playing against bloody <laughs> Dennis, you know. <laughs> so I will do the stats on Duffy. Some of Duffy's stats, like aerial challenges, will be e- elite world class, right? But is I've never I've never I've never seen a player commit so many individual errors and not get dropped until now in, 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 for any team. And that, that, that aspect of his game, he's off the scale in terms of individual errors, just off the scale. We're, yeah, talking, so, we're talking as if he had two Ambroses on the field at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I, I have two comments on that, So on this topic. So um, if you look at the better coach sides, or what I would argue are the better coach sides that have faced us when Duffy's played, that's exactly what they've done. I mean, they don't even compete for the duels, the aerial duels with him. They well, basically, you compete. You, you kind of you, you make it as difficult as you can, right? Well, no, what I'm saying yeah. is it, what, what, what I've noticed is some of the better coach sides, they just let him have his header and the guy backs off him to win the second ball. I mean, yeah. that, you know, if I'm if I'm five, nine or five, ten, why am I in as aggressive as he is in the air other than, you know, drawing a foul? there's not much hope that you're going to win that ball anyway. And he, he's so um, uh, wild in how he attacks the ball. He rarely heads it in a way that it's is controlled, yeah. Yeah, controlled to a teammate. Yeah. Um, so I've seen teams actually, you can pretty, pretty you know, blatantly see that, 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 that that's a strategy they're deploying. Uh, the, my, my comment on, um, uh, I'm sorry, what's his name? I'm Brain Welsh. fart. Welsh. Jeez, that's what happened. What was it? 8.30 in the morning now. Um, <laughs> is, so, yeah, so I, I looked at this um, yesterday. So his he played a little over 1,000 minutes in the championship, Scottish championship. Um, and and he I think his aerial dual win rate was 48%. So that, that goes to show you. I mean, he's just not going to be um, uh, a dominant for sure. But I think there's a risk of proficiency in – the air as far as uh, defending. And and that's a concern in Scotland, obviously. Um, I think his path, if he can do this, and again, I, I haven't seen him enough. I haven't quantified it enough or analyzed it enough. To me, his, his future would be, if at a club like Celtic, would be more as like a right-sided center back in a back three if he really develops on the ball progression and the passing side. I mean, I'm not sure that we can carry someone of his profile 
in a back two. And we saw that relative to Kilmarnock, yeah, you know, uh, you know, Iyer, you know, in fairness to Welsh, none of that chances were directly his responsibility. I mean, Iyer was abject uh, marking Rossi in, in a couple of those corners. Um, so it wasn't a direct issue, but, you know, maybe if you had someone, if he's paired with Julian, maybe, um, because Julian's a much better defender in, in set pieces aerially than, than Iyer, uh, in my opinion. Um, so might be able to squeak by on that, but, uh, again, I think, and, and to Alan's, that's why I, I raised this as well, as Alan mentioned that we started to see some evidence of, uh, passing proficiency and pack passing. And again, that's where. All, despite all of his issues, uh, uh, somebody like a Beton, when he's when he's played as a right-sided center back in a back three, that's where his value comes from. I mean, he he really can dribble out, he can make passes, switch balls. You know, so if you get that kind of out, output from a Welsh in that kind of system, I think he could be. You know, his deficiencies in the air uh, could be outweighed uh, if the other two defenders in the back three are are more proficient. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I like him. I think he's a really interesting young player. That's my concern though, is he's, he's probably done growing. So if he's, yeah. you know, five ten or five eleven or whatever he is, and he doesn't have uh, serious hops, which I don't think he does. Um, you know, it's a guy, the guy McKenzie from F Philadelphia union that, uh, Celtic were rumored to have been interested in, you know, he's only six one. He went to Genk. Um, but the guy can jump. I mean, he's got serious, uh, uh, vertical leaping ability. So again, it's a total package, you know, just because you're six one versus six four, if you can jump like a, you know, if your vertical's 35 inches, then you can overcome some of that. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I don't, I'm, I'm worried and that, that the Welsh doesn't have that. And again, at a level like the championship where he's losing more than he's winning in the air, uh, I think that's evidence that there could be an issue there. Yeah, and I suppose we'll we'll see by the end of the season if he's playing a little bit more. The picture yeah. might become a little bit more clear as the play him. I mean, more, there, the more data no we get, so. not to play him. That's yeah. No Welsh and Ayer's at that stage. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So play play Ayer, play Welsh, play Ajati up front with Edward, and hopefully we might get to see a couple of more victories over the next couple of weeks. Motherwell at home this Saturday. We'll have a breakdown of that next week, same time, around usually around Thursday at midday, we get the podcast recorded enough for you, so we'll try to keep that going as much as we can over the next couple of weeks. To all you who listened and subscribed to the 20 Minute Tim's podcast, thank you very much, and if you want to get the monthly 20 Minute Tim's Patreon podcast, which is a broader look at things, then you can subscribe to their Patreon on their Twitter. Follow us at Huddle Breakdown on Twitter, on Instagram. And you can subscribe on YouTube as well. If you're watching, just hit the subscribe button below to get notified every time an episode goes live. Alan, James, thanks very much. Another week done and dusted. We'll chat to you later.